So, Sam, our next guest. Yes, Dr. Sue, Francis Sue. Yeah. Uh, is, uh, I guess I'll introduce him as, as, a, as he transitions on. Um, so, Dr. Sue is the uh, Benedictine uh, Carwell Professor of Mathematics at the Harvey Mudd College and former president of the Mathematical Association of America, so the MAA. Um, in 2013, he received the uh, Haimo Award, a national, a nationwide teaching prize for college math uh, faculty. And in 2018, uh, he won the Halmos Ford uh, Writing Award. And so his research is in uh, geometric combinatorics, includes many papers he's co-authored uh, with uh, some undergraduates. I've had the chance to uh, see some of his talks and some of his work and um I'm always impressed by what what he has done and uh, the impact he has made. So, without any further ado, uh, Francis, are you are you here? Hello, hello. How's it going? Hey, Francis. Oh, yeah. Good. Happy Good. Pi Day. Nice to see yeah. you. Happy yeah. Pi Day. Great to see you uh, both as well. I I, I, uh, I uh, I'm appreciating this format, the uh, the hosts and the conversation, things like that. Has been watching uh, the earlier, uh, some of the earlier talks. I sort of feel like a news anchor here. I just need yeah. to the weather report from time to time to show up in the. In yeah, the that's weather. a good that's way right. to put it. Yeah, yeah this hosting. Yeah. <laughs> I think we're all. I think being a host is uh, sort of imitating all the hosts you've ever seen. But I guess that's right, true with right. life, right? Being a teacher is imitating the teachers you've seen. Being a mathematician yeah. is imitating the mathematicians you've seen. So a lot of life is imitation. That's um, right. Um, so uh, Francis, um, we were very lucky, uh, was, came to, to Lafayette College a few years ago and gave two wonderful talks. Um, and we still have people to talk about your visit. So thank you. Um, thank you. That, that must have been right before the pandemic. Yeah, it was pretty close. Yeah. Um, back in the in the olden days, hopefully we'll be back to that pretty soon. Um, but we're really excited about uh, your talk today, um, and um, I guess this would be about the right time to transition. We have more questions. None for me. Okay. Um, Francis well, has given a lot of really inspiring talks, and. Um, his his sense of self, his sense of who he is as a mathematician and where the, where he fits in the mathematical world and how the mathematical world should treat people and should react to people um, has inspired a lot of people. I'm really excited about um, seeing you give a talk today, Francis. Thank so, you. Um, Sam, I guess you're the official. Here we go. Here, here we go without any. Well, before I go. Uh, <laughs> Uh, my time as co-hosting is is drawing nigh, so uh, you may not see my face after uh, Francis's talk. So um, during that transition and during his talk, um, I appreciate the opportunity to be uh, in this platform and uh, to be involved. And I hope to be involved uh, even more in the future. So without any further ado, Francis, you have control. Thank you. Thanks so much, Samuel. So uh, it's uh, it's really nice uh, to be here, uh, and I, I'm wondering how now I make my slides available. Um, do I are, are my slides visible? Oh, there you go. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, so uh, yeah, so I'm excited to be here. This is uh, my first um, uh, introduction to the uh, Prison Math Project, although I, I heard about it for some time, uh, especially because. Uh, one of my collaborators, uh, Christopher Jackson, is often confused with Christopher Havens, who is uh, one of the founders of the, the Prison Math Project. And so I'll say a little bit more about that. Um, and I'm going to uh, talk about a, a particular game called the Game of Cycles, which uh, you might grab a pen and paper if you have one handy. Uh, and if you have a friend nearby, you could even maybe play the game. Uh, but it'd be useful to, uh, to explore. Uh, and I want to tell you a little bit about some of the things that uh, we discovered about this game. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about the game. But first, let me say a little bit about my collaborators. So I, I have a number of people who uh, I worked with on this project. 
Um, and you see them here, Shanice Walker, uh, Ryan Alvarado, Leah Carker, Maya Abbott, Mal Martiniak, and uh, Ben Gaines, uh, and uh, uh, who are all uh, math professors at various schools around the country. Uh, and Christopher Jackson, who is an incarcerated uh, man, uh, who I first started uh, playing this game with. So I, I, I basically invented a game uh, as I was writing uh, this book called Mathematics for Human Flourishing. Uh, and uh, and uh, I've, uh, I started playing this game with Chris. So Chris, Christopher Jackson is uh, an incarcerated man who um, first uh, discovered his love for mathematics while in prison. He was uh, sentenced uh, as a teenager uh, for a series of, of um, uh, armed robberies uh, and uh, has been in prison now for um, I think close to 15 years. Uh, in the last seven or uh, last several years or so, he's many years or so, he's been um, studying mathematics, um, basically working his way up from college algebra, uh, from algebra textbooks to, um, to uh, higher level mathematics now. And uh, in 2013 or so, he wrote me a letter uh, out of the blue uh, asking for help in furthering his math education. So that began a long correspondence uh, in which uh, we've talked a, a lot about life and about um, uh, our mathematical interests and, and other things. And um, he's also a collaborator on this book uh, in which you'll get to hear some of his story uh, uh, in uh, in. Uh, uh, it, 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 as a way of uh, helping people, I think, see that uh, everybody does mathematics, everybody has a capability of doing math, and, um, and that's part of the, the message that uh, we uh, wanted to send uh, in our conversations in this book. And one of the things that we did in this book, actually, was introduce this game, and uh, I want to tell you a little bit about this game. Uh, and then... Uh, after we played it for a while, we realized there's some interesting questions here. And so uh, at a workshop at this place called ICER, uh, which is a, uh, a, a research institute at Brown University, I involved a number of the other collaborators whom you see on this slide. Uh, and uh, we studied the game further. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about some of the things we discovered. Um, so without uh, further uh, I do. Let me just tell you what the game is. So basically, the game can be played with pen and paper. Uh, you uh, will draw a board, which is basically what mathematicians like to call a, a planar graph. And that just means draw a bunch of dots and draw a bunch of edges. So if you have a pen and paper, go ahead and, and make your own board. It doesn't have to look like these. And basically draw a connected set of dots and edges. And that's your board, okay? So you could decide to play this game on any board you like. Uh, and then the way the game is played is once you have a board, you have two players who take turns marking uh, an edge with an arrow. So if you uh, take a look at this um, slide here, you'll see that in the bottom picture, there is a, uh, a single edge marked with an arrow. And that's basically the first player just made a move, okay? Now, the second player will continue by marking another edge with an arrow. And basically, you'll go back and forth marking edges with arrows. There's some limitations, though. Uh, we, for instance, uh, you, you, every first of all, every edge is only marked once. And then you don't allow what we'll call sinks or sources. So a sink is a dot where all the edges are marked, and they're marked pointing towards the dot. Okay, it's called a sink because basically everything's flowing towards the, the drain. Um, a source, everything flows away from the dot. And so every edge is marked and it's marked flowing away from the dot. Okay, so these are called sinks or sources. Here's another example of a sink, of, um, a couple of examples of sinks here on this slide, a couple of examples of sources on the slide, and these are not allowed. Okay, so as you play the game, you want to avoid making sinks of sources. And the goal of the game is to produce what we'll call a cycle cell. So a cycle 
is basically a collection of edges that are all marked flowing in a direction where 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 they uh, they follow each other. They just flow from one to another to another to another and then back to uh, a place where you've been before. And if you look at this bottom uh, figure on this slide, you see in red a cycle that is marked. And a cycle cell is a cycle that surrounds a single cell. Okay, so that's that's an important distinction. You can have a cycle that moves throughout this board, but for instance, I, I'm not sure actually if you can see my cursor. Can you all see my cursor as I move the cursor around the slide? I don't know if uh, maybe one of the, if Gary can too. I don't see it. Okay, so I guess I can't use my my my. Yeah, I don't cursor. see it. Okay, that's good to know. So um, if you look at this bottom figure, uh, there's a uh, there's a cycle here that doesn't that runs around two of the cells, but not one of the cells. We're not interested in those kinds of cycles. We only want cycles that surround a single cell, like the one that's marked in red. Okay, that's the goal. That's the that's the the object of the game. Okay, so now now that we've uh, seen uh, the the game. Uh, take a moment to, to play this game, either with yourself or maybe with a neighbor. Here's a, uh, a board that I drew. You can, of course, use your own board. But uh, in this board, we'll just play a, a few moves here to see how this game, you know, learn some things about the game. Uh, and this, in fact, was the board that Chris and I first started playing um, in our correspondence back and forth. I don't know if, if uh, any of you know exactly how uh, correspondence works, but uh, with uh, inmates in, in federal prison, Chris is in a federal penitentiary. Uh, and, you know, uh, one way you could, we corresponded at first was through physical letters, but there is a, a limited, very limited prison email system, uh, which um, doesn't allow access to the internet, but it is a way that we, uh, we started communicating more uh, later on in our, uh, in our class, uh, in our correspondence uh, and so and it doesn't allow graphics like this so we basically had to uh, write you know the signify to each other in text the next move that we would play but okay here's a here's a board uh, and so you know the first person may make a move like this marked with a, a green arrow and i've just labeled it number one so you see the order of the moves so once the first player makes this move you might think if you're player two, well, how would you respond? Remember, you're trying to create a cycle cell or you're trying to be the last player to be able to make a move. Okay, so it, you could, you could, you, 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 if you end the game and no one can make a move, then the last player who makes a move will win. What would you like to do next? Well, there's lots of choices. Let me show you one pot potential choice you could make that's actually not a good move. So for instance, if you mark the next move here, if you're player two, this is a bad move. Can you see why this is a bad move? Yeah, if you think about it, this is a bad move because the next, the first player can then play uh, this move and create a, a cycle cell. Okay, so just created a cycle that goes around a single cell. And so you want to avoid what we call death moves. Uh, this is called a death move because it is the second last uh, edge of a cycle. And whenever you do that, you automatically are going to die on the next turn if the, you know, if the next player just completes the cycle. Okay? So you want to avoid a death move. So let's, go, let's start again. Maybe you, maybe you don't want to make this move, uh, the, move we, the, the move I just showed. Um, so what would you do next? Well, here's another move you could make. Maybe you play the, this edge marked uh, pointing away from the lower right dot. OK? OK, so uh, what next? Well, now it's player one's move. And player one can play a number of different things. One thing I want you to notice is that player one cannot play the bottom edge pointing to the left because that would create a source in the bottom, sorry, in the bottom right corner. You, you might worry about creating a source if the first player responds with a move 
uh, that's pointing to the left on the bottom edge. So suppose that first player decides to play, oh yeah, so, oh, yes. So this edge actually is, not only does the first player not want to play this edge pointing to the left, but they also don't want to play this edge pointing to the right, because if they played this edge pointing to the right, it would be a death move around the cell that's at the bottom of this triangle, okay? So you cannot play this, it would not be a wise move for player one to play this either left or right. And so for that reason, we'll call this edge currently unplayable. And the reason I say it's currently unplayable is that it might later become playable. And that's an interesting feature to notice after you play this game a few times. So for instance, if player one now plays this edge instead, you'll notice that the bottom edge is now playable by either player. I guess player two is going next. Because now, playing to the right, playing the bottom edge to the right will not be a death move. And it's certainly now playable to the right, but not to the left, because if you play it to the left, you'll have a source in the bottom right side. OK? So um, OK, so that's interesting. Suppose the second player now plays this move. Now, the interesting thing that happened here is that the bottom edge now actually becomes what we call unmarkable. And the reason is because if, if you played it to the left or to the right, you're going to create a sink or a source on, the, on either of these two endpoints, OK, on both of these endpoints. So now, once an edge is unmarkable, it stays unmarkable for the rest of the game. And that's also an important thing to, to notice um, for trying to understand the game. OK, in fact, now I believe the other edge that's uh, unmarked is also unmarkable. Because if you play the, the other edge pointing up, the top, is, top dot is a sink. And if you play it pointing down, the middle dot is a sink. OK, so both edges are currently unmarkable. OK, so there's some things that you notice about this game for a little while that after you play it. Okay, and I've just now restated all these things to notice that your death moves are marking the second to last edge of a cycle. You want to avoid those. Unplayable edges might become playable later, and unmarkable edges always stay unmarkable. All right, so what are some questions that come to mind for you? And go ahead and um, uh, think of a question that might come to mind after you play this game. Yeah, I'm I'm monitoring the chat. So if anybody wants to put um, comments in, um, or, I'm, questions. or questions, yeah. If not, I was perfectly clear to everybody. Either that, or I am perfectly unable to find the comments. I see <laughs> private chat. I'm sure that's wrong. Um, okay. So. That's fine. I'll ask a couple more, a few questions that come to mind after we played the game. Here's one uh, question you might ask for a given board. Which player has a winning strategy? Is it player one or player two? And by winning strategy, what we mean is, uh, is there a, a well-defined um, uh, uh, strategy that one player can play to guarantee that they can win no matter what the other player does? Uh, Francis, EJ Jennings uh, Pennings has a quick question. If you could just please explain the difference again between a cycle and a cycle cell. Yes. A cycle is a path that, that uh, loops back on itself in the board. A cycle cell is, is, a, is a cycle that goes around a single cell. Okay, so we're just trying to find a cycle that goes around a single cell in the board, not potentially many cells. OK. Um, another question uh, I noticed uh, here in the private chat uh, is that how, how any limits on how big the board can be? And the answer is no. Well, I mean, there, there are interesting questions for large boards, which you may wish to explore. Uh, but yes, the boards can be as large as you want. They should be finite. It should be, you know, you want the game to end uh, eventually. All right. Great questions. Question that we asked, of course, is for a given board, who has a winning strategy? 
it's a well-known theorem from game theory that in this kind of game, one of the players is going to have a winning strategy. That may not be so obvious, but in, in this kind of type of game, it turns out that it, that's true. And so our question was, who has a winning strategy? And so if you have your own board that you created, it's quite possibly an unknown question yet, who has the winning strategy for the board that you considered? And what I want to show you is some of the results that we got about which boards, a certain boards that we can show certain players have winning strategies, OK? And now, um, another question is uh, that we asked after we played this game a lot is, is it possible to end the game with every edge marked, but nobody having a cycle sell? Because every game that we ever played, and then we played a lot of different games, whenever you finished the board and marked every edge, it seemed like there was a cycle sell somewhere. Okay, so it seemed like it was impossible. So there was a, two questions that actually became, uh, which was mot motivated us. Uh, and, uh, in, and I want to tell you a little bit about what we know about the answers to both of these questions. So um, a good place to start is a n-gon, uh, just a polygon, just a board with a single cell. That's an n-gon, OK? And uh, this is easy to understand, so we'll start with it. In a very simple result, player one wins if the number of sides to this cell is odd, and player two wins if n is even. And the, the way to see that is whenever you have a, a board that looks like a, a, this polygon, you'll notice that because of the source and sink rule, you don't allow those, Whenever you have an edge, if it borders another a marked edge, when if it borders another marked edge, those two edges have to be marked flowing in the same direction. Because if they were flowing opposite each other, it would be a sink uh, or a source. Okay, so whenever you have two edges that are marked and that side by side, they have to be um, pointing in the same direction. And, uh, and so if you ever switch directions, it's because you have an unmarkable edge. So in this picture, I have two, pointing, uh, two going clockwise and one going counterclockwise. And in between them, there's a single edge that's unmarkable. OK? And so if you fill up the board with arrows, at the end of the game, when nobody can make a move, well, first of all, if you end the game with a cycle, then every edge has been marked flowing the same direction. Okay, that's unlikely to happen with a couple of players because you know the second player is going to try to find the uh, stymie the first. But if you have uh, uh, a uh, uh, at the end of the game, every edge is marked and no one can make any more moves. What has to happen is it has to be the case that all the unmarkable edges, the number of unmarkable edges, is even. They have to come in pairs. And the reason is, at the end of the game, if every edge is marked, it's basically going to have some sequence of clockwise and counterclockwise flowing uh, edges. And they're separated by unmarkable edges. And so if you start clockwise and you follow the, the edges around, you have to end at a clockwise pointing edge. Then there had to be an even number of unmarkable edges in between. OK? OK, so that's the reason why at the end of the game, um, if you these unmarkable edges come in pairs, then it's just the number of edges, whether it's odd or even, that's going to matter, right? Because um, you, you win if an even number of arrows are marked. Uh, I mean, the, the game ends if, it, if, if an even number of um, arrows are marked. Uh, and sorry, player two wins if an even number of arrows are marked because player two made the last move. Or player one wins if an odd number of arrows are marked. And um, because they come in pairs, then it just depends on whether there's an even or odd number of edges to begin with. OK. OK. Um, one thing to notice about this game is that actually the strategy doesn't really matter here because you know if you just play the game, it, you, it, it, you're going to win, okay? As long as you don't make a stupid move. Um, by stupid, I mean making a death move or something. Um, um, any strategy is going to to work, uh, and the players don't even have to think about it. Okay, great. That was a very, very simple example of a board where we could say something. 
Here's another board that may be a little more interesting, a board with many cells. And um, I'm going to show you how you how you might. So it turned out for this particular board and some others, we now know how to win uh, at this at the who has a winning strategy for this board. Okay, and I claim it's player two. Okay, so if you follow along, I'm going to be player two. Okay, so suppose player one makes so supplier player one makes this move. I'm going to play the strategy that I know will work, and I'm going to invite you to see if you can guess what the strategy is that I'm playing. OK? So that was player one, and now I'm going to play this move. OK, so now the other player makes this move, let's say. And now I'm going to make this move. Did you see what I just did? Let's keep going. Other player makes this move. And now I'm going to make this move. All right. Does anybody have a guess as to what, what strategy, what my strategy is? I'll keep going. Here we go. I make this move. Sorry, the other player makes this move, and I make this move. You'll notice there's a pattern to, the, to the, the, the responses that I'm giving to player one. And now the, if the other player makes this move, that was a death move and I should I should finish up and and just complete a cycle. okay? Okay, so that, there's a there's a, um, uh, a game that we just played. And uh, uh, and so here's a question. How, how should we, um, uh, what was the strategy that I just employed? Um, I, I'm going to take a moment for let you think about that. I'll try to answer some questions that I, I, I um, have heard come, came up in the chat. Um, oh, yeah, one person asked, is a cell a face? Yeah, I should have said that. A cell is just a... Uh, a, uh, a single connected piece that's inside uh, the graph. And sometimes mathematicians call them faces if it's a face of a simplicial complex. Um, let's see. Another person asked, since big boards are allowed, is it known how the complexity compares to Go? Uh, good question. I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, and a, a few other mathematicians who've started playing it, uh, who've started studying this game, I, I haven't heard that they've studied this question. So I, I don't know. That may be something that could be answered by someone here, potentially. Uh, but I imagine the, compl it, I, I imagine the complexity is pretty, um, is pretty, uh, uh, is pretty big. Um, uh, okay, great. So um, what was the strategy I was playing? Well, you might have noticed as I played this game, and I'll just back up here because it might be easier to see if I do, do it again, that I was I, that this board has a certain symmetry to it, and I took advantage of that symmetry by basically mimicking the other player's move in a peculiar way. So the first player played this move, well, what's the, what's the symmetry this board had? It has 180 degree rotational symmetry, which means if I rotate this board 180 degrees, it looks like itself, OK? And if you rotate this arrow that the first player just played, it will go to the bottom left corner, but it will be pointing down if you do the 180 degree rotation. And I play this edge pointing up. See that? So uh, let's see what, what happened again. So suppose the next player made this move, which is pointing to the left. Again, if you rotate this board 180 degrees, this arrow turns into an arrow on the right middle side pointing to the right, but I played it to the left. OK? So I'm basically doing a, um, uh, you, Performing the symmetry, but reversing the arrow. Here we go. 
the first player makes this move, and you do the the, the 180 degree rotation, it should be pointing away from the the center. But now I'm I'm marked it pointing towards. And I just continue doing that until the other player makes a death move. If they make a death move, then I just respond by completing the cycle. Okay, so that's the strategy. We call this a, a mirror reverse strategy. And uh, and so one of the, several of the questions you have to ask if you want to prove that this strategy works on a board with 180 degree symmetry, you want to check that the move is first always available. Uh, and secondly, doesn't create a sinker source, because that would be a bad move. And third, won't cause you to make a death move. Okay. If you can show each of these three things, then the strategy is going to work. Uh, and so if you think a little bit about why this move is always available, it's it's always available because if it had been played already, then the 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 previous edge would have been played already. Okay, and it wasn't. That's one way to see that. It doesn't create a sink or source because if you created a sink with your move and you were playing this strategy, the, pri pre the previous move, the other player would have created a sink as well. Okay. And then it won't cause a death move. This is probably a little more subtle. Why is it that your move actually doesn't isn't the second to last edge of a cycle. You might think, well, maybe it's because the previous player's move wasn't the second to uh, last edge of a cycle. And the problem is that yours might still be, even if theirs wasn't. If you had the funny situation that the edge that you just added that mirrored their edge was on the same cycle, uh, on the same cell as the other cycle. So I'll show you some examples of that in a minute. But it, we have to be careful here that, that, that not every board that has symmetry in this way will be uh, well, this last condition hold. So here's what we mean by symmetry. Actually, once we show this result was true, the result I'm about to show you was true for symmetric boards, we show that it can actually hold for other kinds of symmetry, not just 180 degree symmetry, but symmetry, reflective symmetry. Okay. And both of these symmetries, reflective symmetry, which I'm doing with my hand, and rotational symmetry, are both examples of what you might call involutive symmetry. It's just a fancy word for a symmetry that repeats, uh, that if you do it twice, it, it um, leaves the board unchanged. Okay. So one way to say that is if you have involutive symmetry, then every edge has an edge that it's matched with, and that edge is matched with the original edge if you do the symmetry. Okay, so uh, if it's reflective, then you have symmetry around some axis, and if it's rotation, it's symmetry around 180 degree rotate with 180 degree rotation. Okay, and in both these cases, you can play what's called what we call the re mirror reverse strategy. You just perform the symmetry, and then you reverse the arrow. Okay. Okay, so um, here's the theorem that we, we proved, that if you have a board with reflective symmetry, oh, so this is the other kind, if you have reflective symmetry, and, in the, uh, uh, and there's no edge along the axis of symmetry, then um, player two has a winning strategy if there's no edge that crosses the axis of symmetry. And player one has a winning strategy if there's only one edge crossing the axis. So what I mean by that, here are some examples on this slide. Um, all, these, all these boards have uh, symmetry around an axis uh, uh, that's vertical, OK? And so on the left, you see examples of the, the leftmost board Every edge has a partner, a reflective partner. Uh, in the middle board, every edge has a reflective partner except for the edge, the horizontal edge. That horizontal edge is its own partner under the symmetry. Okay, so that's an edge that crosses the axis of symmetry. Okay. 
So on the left board, there's no edge crossing the axis symmetry. Player two has a winning strategy just by following the mirror reverse strategy. In the middle board, player one has a winning strategy. If player one on their first move plays the horizontal edge that crosses the axis, and then player two makes their move and player one responds by mirror reverse. Okay, so player two, so in this case, player one plays the horizontal edge, and then player, whatever player two does, player one responds in the mirror reversing way. That I claim is gonna be a winning strategy. And if you look at the right picture, this is an example of a board for which this theorem doesn't answer the question who has a winning strategy. That's what I mean by fail. This strategy fails because uh, in this board, um, there's an edge along the axis of symmetry. That's the vertical edge. And um, in this case, if you think about it a little bit, um, if you if you play the mirror reverse strategy, the problem is that um, uh, you might actually play the person playing the mirror reverse strategy might make a death move, even if the other move wasn't a death move for the other player. You can see that if player one marks the horizontal edge going up on the right board, and um, the second player marks an edge going up. Uh, uh, the, uh, one of those top edges going up. Then the other player, if they try to mirror reverse, will make an edge pointing down, and that would create a death. Okay, so here's a, that's a theorem that we have for reflective symmetry. Uh, for 180 degree symmetry, a uh, very similar result holds, but as long as a edge and its partner under the symmetry don't live together on the same cell, then, once again, if no edge passes through the center of symmetry, the board center, player two is a winning strategy. And if there's only one edge to the board center, player one has a winning strategy. So this picture on the left are boards where this strategy works. On the right, it doesn't work. So let me just explain. The leftmost board uh, has no edge through the board center. It has 180 degree symmetry. And so player two wins just by mirror reversing anything player one does. On the middle board, player one has a winning strategy by playing the center edge. And then mirror reversing, whenever player two makes a move, player one plays a mirror reverse strategy. OK. Uh, and, uh, and great. And then on the right board, uh, this is a fail. The problem here, it does have 180 degree symmetry, but the problem here is that an edge, like the one in the uh, diagonal edge, uh, one of the diagonal edges is the partner of the other diagonal edge. And it's possible for the player, one player to play a diagonal edge and the other player to mirror reverse and then uh, accidentally make a death move. That's the problem. Okay, so we don't know what happens from this strategy. The strategy won't work on this board. That doesn't mean that you can't answer the question who wins, but it just means this strategy is not a winning strategy. Okay, so if we wanna make this a maybe a little more, uh, uh, do this a little more carefully, I'm just gonna uh, flash up some, some uh, of what we know. So we just try to carefully um, categorize the kinds of situations you can have. Um, and so whenever you have an involutive board with one of those symmetries, then you could call a cell self-involutive if it's its own partner. We'll call it nowhere in the involutive if no edge of the cell has a partner also in the cell. And it's part involutive if it's not its own partner, not self-involutive, but some edge has a partner also in the cell. And it's this third situation that we don't want to have happen. So um, if you know only those first two situations happen for every cell on the board, then a mirror reverse strategy works. That's what this theorem says. Player two has a winning strategy. Basically, if there are an odd a number of edges, uh, even number of edges, and player one wins if there's only one self-involutive edge. And uh, the proof idea is basically 
showing the same three things can uh, have that the uh, same three things as we saw earlier is the move always available to play does it never lead to a sink or source and is it not a death move and basically because we didn't allow that third kind of part involutive cell that's why you can do this this strategy and um and, and that's that's the theorem now it should be noted that we don't have any answers to what happens if you have more than one self-involuted edge. Okay, so you can have these kinds of boards, um, but and and not have a and not have uh, the weird situation part involuted cell. Uh, but uh, it's still we still not may not be able to answer that question. All right, um, so that's that's the partial answer we have for symmetric boards. Uh, to the first question. And now the second question, I'll just give you a sense of uh, what, what happens, and then we'll, uh, we'll call it a day. So um, the second question was, must a board where every edge is marked and you know with no sources or sinks have a cycle cell? That is a single cell where every edge, um, with it, where uh, the edges flow around the cell in one direction. So here's another way to say it. Suppose you have a city where you've made every street a one-way street. And there's no stupid intersections, meaning it, every intersection ha must have a way of entering and a way of leaving, right? There's no sinks. You, you, there's no intersections where all the, the one-way streets point in or ones where they all point out, okay? The claim or the question, the conjecture is that every such city with one-way streets and no stupid intersections must have a single block that the traffic flows around. It's a little surprising if you think about it, like, oh, really? Not, not just have, it's, it's probably obvious that, you know, if, you, if it's a finitely many, you know, intersections that you'll end up flowing if you just follow one-way streets. The question is, why does there have to be a single block around which the, the traffic flows? Uh, that's a, that's an interesting question worth uh, thinking about. And uh, that's, in fact, what we show. So this is our theorem, uh, the theorem that I mentioned with Christopher and several other, other uh, mathematicians. Any planar graph with arrows on every edge and no source of sinks must have a cycle cell. And uh, the, the proof is actually very technical, a uh, little complicated, but I'll just give you a sort of hand-wavy description of how you might go about arguing. So the first thing you might note in the leftmost picture here is that if you just follow one-way streets, eventually you're going to have to create a cycle. But it may not be a cycle around a single. You might not end up with a cycle around a single block. But you, you end up in some kind of cycle. And so the idea is if you end up in some kind of cycle, the, str the strategy is to try to show, to make, uh, to show there's a smaller cycle around which the traffic flows. And if you just get smaller and smaller at every step, that means eventually you have to just get down to one particular cell that's being cycled around. And the way we do that is just by carefully keeping track of which, uh, which um, street we use to leave an intersection when you enter it. Uh, and there are a couple of choices. When you enter an intersection, you could go around uh, the intersection clockwise and pick the first one that leaves. Or you can go around counterclockwise and pick the first street that leaves. And either of these two rules, you know, you follow it, you'll get a cycle. And then the idea is if you change the rule, you'll get a, a different cycle if you do it carefully, you know, a smaller one. And that's what these pictures on the right are supposed to represent. But I think that's about all I'll say about that argument. If you want to, to be more technical, you can certainly see some details or I can try to answer some questions later. But um, that strategy surprisingly ends up working. So it ends up taking you to something that's a single cell. And um, oh, here's another thing I wanted to point out that actually since we proved that result in the paper that we wrote, uh, I had some other students work on thinking about simpler arguments because that one's extremely technical. And so here it turns out that um, the point of view to take is that a field board's a bit like a vector field, but on a graph. So a vector field is like you know wind flowing on you know on a map on a picture. Here, wind is uh, traffic is flowing on the edges of a graph. 
And there's this theorem from topology, an area of math concerning continuous mathematics, that is for vector fields uh, like wind. It's called the Poincaré Hopf Index Theorem. Whatever it says, just know it to be some, some theorem that basically the question we asked was, oh, is there a similar theorem for vector fields on graphs? And it turns out that there is. And so my student, Savannah Ammons, um, in a recent senior thesis project, basically came up with uh, an idea. If you know what an index theorem is, great. If you don't, don't worry about it. But basically came up with an idea for how to generalize this idea of indices, but for vector fields on graphs. Now, it turns out that, as we learned only um, uh, learned throughout the course of our investigation, someone actually had, had invented this notion before, somebody named Glass. Um, but then the contribution that Savannah still uh, made was using this in index. It turns out you can provide a very simple proof of the fact that uh, every vector field um, that's marked, where every edge is marked um, in this way, uh, has a cycle cell. Okay, so uh, I'll leave that for Q&A if people want to ask about that. But it's, uh, it's pretty neat that uh, there are multiple ways of understanding this result. Okay. Um, okay, so oh, there's some stuff here that's describing this, this idea. Maybe briefly I'll just say... Um, no, I think I won't say it here because it might be a little too technical to say here. Okay, so lots of questions you can ask. Uh, many of you have probably asked some in the chat already. Um, but uh, uh, one question you might ask is, gosh, is it always true that, that you know, an even number of edges means player, um, uh, player two always wins with an even number of edges? I mean... Up until, uh, up until uh, I gave this question to another senior thesis student, it, it seemed like every board we'd ever studied where we had a winning strategy, it was player two who won with an even number of edges and player one and won with an odd number of edges. Uh, but surprisingly, um, my student actually came up with some examples where you, uh, where that's not always the case, okay? And so again, uh, I can say more about that if you want to ask that in the chat. Lots of other questions you can ask here. What happens? Um, how do you play with more than three people? Uh, there's a question. Certainly, you can define the game for for more than three people. Is can you say something about the way uh, uh, about how you you play? I mean, here you have to uh, worry about the the possibility of collusion between players, and so there may be some cooperative aspects here to this game. Um, another question uh, is just studying a simple case of the board with two polygonal cells. Many of the cases that are covered there are covered by the symmetry theorem, but not all of them. Um, in the case where you have more than one common edge, what happens? Uh, this picture here shows a two-story house. It's the simplest game that we know about where we don't know how to solve this game. Uh, and the reason here is that this board has reflective symmetry, uh, but it has more than one self-involutive edge. It has three edges that cross the axis of, of intersection. We don't know how to solve this game. We don't know who has the winning strategy. Um, you can define this game an arbitrary cell complex. That's another way to take the game. Uh, you might change the game a little bit and ask, well, what if you change the goal? What if the goal is to get as many cycle cells as possible? Um, what can we say about that? All right, lots of lots of open questions here. Just want to um, just give you uh, the sense that there's actually a lot of interesting open questions here. Uh, if you're interested, the, uh, the 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 paper that we wrote just came out recently in the American Mathematical Monthly uh, in January, uh, and you'll find the two research questions unanswered in the book, uh, Mathematics for Human Flourishing, which has a number of uh, reflections by Christopher Jackson. Uh, here's a picture of us uh, together um, in front of a, a mural uh, at the prison uh, where he, he is at. Um, I visited him now twice, uh, and this is the only place they allowed us to take a picture is in, in front of this mural, which, uh, which I guess, I guess it was it's um, uh, 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 supposed to be a nice background for people to take pictures in front of. Um, just want to say, maybe end with a few words about, um, about uh, Chris and about, uh, 
uh, the work of the Prison Map Project. Um, it, 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 Chris was uh, sentenced under some very harsh uh, sentencing laws uh, in the, uh, that I think were established in the 1990s. Um, he's serving a, a 32 year sentence for two uh, crimes in which nobody was hurt. Uh, and um, I think that's a, a real shame that, uh, that uh, we have uh, some very harsh sentencing laws on the book, on the books. Uh, and uh, I think we need to do more uh, to uh, reduce, uh, reduce some of these harsh sentences. Um, I'm, I'm grateful to learn about the work of the Prison Mathematics Project. Um, I, uh, uh, I think uh, learning mathematics is a way for, uh, uh, for people to, to grow uh, and to, to flourish in ways they might not otherwise um, have the opportunity to do. And I think everybody should have that opportunity. So uh, I hope you'll uh, join uh, the work of the Prison Mathematics Project or, uh, or um, endeavors like this one. Uh, that uh, give hope and uh, a sense of uh, personal um, growth um, for, uh, for more people. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Francis. Oh, Gary, hey. you're muted. Not anymore. Um, <laughs> great talk, Francis. Thank you so much. Um, love to open this to questions um i'm monitoring three chats and i think i'm missing all three of them uh Alyssa, I could use some help yeah sure so let's see so i think francis you did answer the ones um in the public chat right about um uh the big boards knowing about the complexity yeah i think so yeah which is basically i don't know uh i don't know the answer to that and i'm not sure anyone else does Right now, there's only a handful of people I know about who are thinking about this game and related games. Um, several of the collaborators, I think, have some projects or with students or others. Uh, uh, I think um, um, uh, Bryant Matthews recently had a paper that appeared on the archive in which he studies um, uh, a variation of this game. Uh, and I don't know that anybody's asked complexity questions, so that's uh, something to, to note. I've seen so many um, graph games, but this, this seems so fundamental and it seems new, so that's kind of amazing. Um, yeah, it kind of surprised me as well, because I, you know, I was just looking for an interesting uh, puzzle to try to include in the book, since the book, the book isn't a book of puzzles, it's a book about reflections about what it means to be a human being. But in between the chapters, uh, I've included some puzzles of various kinds just to get people to think about math as, as a way of exploring. And I thought, you know, actually it'd be fun to actually come up with a, an interesting question that Chris and I could also study together. And so, um, you know, I love topology and I, I love these kinds of you know, games that involve graphs and things like that. And so I thought, oh, maybe this might be an interesting game. But I couldn't find, you know, any anything like it in the literature. Uh, and it's certainly had some interesting topological features. Um, if if for, for those listeners who know something about the Brower fixed point theorem, the idea that there's cycle cell, they must have a cycle cell in this, oh, in this board, yeah. is actually very reminiscent of, of Bra the Brower fixed point the theorem. Proof. Yeah. yeah, and... And yet again, I also don't know the, the connection there because I, I I haven't yet seen a way to, to use Sperner's lemma to prove this thing or whatever, you know. So there, there are some interesting questions available. Sorry, I didn't cut you off. But. No, 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 no. I was just, it, a lot of things occurred to me during your talk. I was thinking about trying to do this for the platonic solids. Um, it occurred to me that a lot of those could be handled by your symmetry condition. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, although, so that's a planar. You're, you're thinking about the graph on the edge of a... Of I want a, to take that last yeah. cycle and call it a cycle, which you weren't doing here. Um, right. That's right. What yeah, happen, and you... No, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I, I was going to ask a different question. I was just kind of curious to your reaction first to, to this. Yeah, um, so that's a question that actually we frequently get. Why don't you consider the whole outside another cell? And... You certainly could, uh, and that would be playing the game not on a plane but on a on a, a sphere. Right. Uh, and then 
the index theorem that I referred to, which also holds for vector fields on what are called manifolds, um, the, the, the analog of that, which Savannah looked at, could still be used to answer this question, uh, potentially, or, or answer the, the Phil Board conjecture question. Um, you, you could call that, you could certainly play the game that way. We didn't, we didn't choose to do that, but maybe there's some interesting things that could be said there. So I guess the last thing I would ask, and maybe this is just for the, um, for the audience, you obviously, you're making up the rules in a game, which is one of the great things about being a mathematician. You can make up your own rules. Um, did you experiment with a few other rule sets before you settled on this one? Uh, yeah, so um, I, I thought about some of the variations that have been described, like the like the outside, counting the outside as a cell. Um, I decided not to do that because um, for the, at least for the audience of the book, it, people, you know, it, it, yeah. it, it jumped to make the leap to say the outside's a cell. When yeah. It's an extra step. Um, and it was already interesting. Um, and I, I also played the game enough with Chris to, to convince myself there was something interesting to be said and it wasn't trivial. That was, those are the only two things I wanted to be to make sure of. But by the, t the, the book wasn't actually, was it was um, in print needed to go to print before we answered those questions. So in the book, actually in the, in the solutions to the puzzles and the appendix, we asked the two questions that were, um, that were addressed in this talk, but, but uh, we didn't know the answers um, when the book went to print. Well, second edition. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We need a new edition every few, uh, few weeks with 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 different exercises <laughs> not <laughs> thanks again for beautiful talk thanks so much thank Francis, you Alice, are you picking up any any more questions or there's another question from the chat um the question was is anyone contemplating the game of cycles on non-planar graphs yeah that's um uh not many people are i had a, a student think about that a little bit um uh, but um there hasn't been uh, much work to, to, to my knowledge, and certainly invite invite you to think about it. It's um, there's a lot of interesting questions. I mean, you could also ask the game. You know, here we're playing just edges, right? But if you have a simplicial complex of some kind, you could play faces, for instance. You have to decide what that means. Um, lots of variations here. I've I've stuck close to things that I think have some mathematical interest. So that the source sink condition is one that, you know, if you do differential equations, you're used to seeing, uh, and it has some topological features mm -hmm. as well. But there may be other variations that are worth thinking about. Another question that people have asked is, what about non things that aren't don't have cell, like playing the games on trees or. Um, so Bryant Matthews, I think if you look at his paper, also a recent um, thesis student, Kylie Lin, uh, studied this question um, on uh, graphs that are have no cycles in them. And then, then it's just a then it's just a game of making seeing which, you know, getting to the end with a certain number of unmarkable edges. <laughs>